Hi, and welcome to this week's the podcast. I am your host, Bex Sherwood, and this week we will be laying the foundations of concrete poetry, discussing our construction process of building our own concrete poems together. My construction crew are here with me today. I'm joined by the wonderful Dr. Katie Ailes, a fabulous architect. Uh, I'm joined by Kevin McLean, the construction consultant, and Mark Galley, who's here to make the tea. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> If Best you are hosting ever so far. <laughs> If you are new to us, welcome. Uh, we are crazy and we're doing this crazy thing called Napo Rimo. Napo Rimo is National Poetry Writing Month. We didn't invent it, but if you want to give us credit, we'll take it. Normally for National Poetry Writing Month, you would be asked to write a poem every single day for the month of April. But we're doing something slightly different and trying to do five poems in five weeks to make sure we have time to really articulate our work and make sure we're super happy with what we produce. Uh, the first week is up. We are now storming away into week two uh, and we've been doing concrete poetry this week so uh i'm going to pass over to dr katie ailes uh, who will the, yeah, the doctor with her medical hat uh will be to hopefully give us a brief introduction into concrete poetry Yes, I am that kind of doctor, as you can tell <laughs> from my apparel. Um, we take poetry very seriously here at I Am Loud Productions. Uh, it is incredibly important. Can universities to... take back degrees, Katie. <laughs> can they? Oh nope. dear. I really hope Strathclyde isn't watching this. Um, <laughs> so yeah, concrete poetry. Uh, basically, despite its title, it is not always made of concrete but it can be, and we'll get to that. Uh, concrete poetry, as we very briefly introduced last week, is a form of poetry in which the visual component of the poem is just as important to the poem's meaning as the text. Um, the visual component has to inform the meaning in some way. So that's a basic definition, and it's really interesting form because um, there are infinite ways, I mean, like all art, there are infinite ways of doing it, but concrete poetry is particularly interesting because there are very few technical restrictions. Instead, it just has to be a form of poetry where the text and the visuals interact in some way to form meaning. Um, you can do it through sculpture, you can do it through 2D art, you can do it through baking food that is in the shape of text. You can do it in, in any number of different ways. Um, and there are so many different examples out there. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to what you guys came up with. Yeah, it's going to be a really good week. This is just a little reminder to our podcast listeners. We are going to be talking about some visual poetry today, and we do have a visual format for you guys to enjoy as well over on youtube.com forward slash I am loud. Mm. So you're welcome to join us there, but we will do our best to describe it for you if you would rather continue with the audio version. And you can always pop over to our Instagram as well, and they'll all be posted up there when this episode is out. So go and check that out. That's also I am loud. We're, just, we're very loud. Yeah, yeah. Or I am like pro. I'm not sure. I am loud, I am loud, yeah. loud, I am loud pro. I'm sorry. <laughs> Who knows? There's so many accounts, back. There's a lot of oh. accounts. So it's, uh, it's hard to keep up. And it's a good thing I'm not the social media manager. But, <laughs> It'd be terrible. Uh, how, did if... you do, how did you find writing Concrete Poem? How was week one of Napo Rimo for you? I know you did so well last year with all these poems that we didn't see. Allegedly. Uh, so how's week one going? Oh immediate jabs immediate jabs at the at the co-champ um i i i found this week i found it very interesting compared to last year and i think not just because of like the very different energy i sort of have between this time last year when i was weird i was very excited for the amount of time i had to do napo rimo last year everything was a bit uncertain so throwing myself into napo rimo was going to be quite fun this time it felt, I felt a bit more relaxed. And it was, uh, the episode last time, I was quite excited to not just do a poem one day and then kind of leave it for potentially forever. So I've been enjoying kind of like uh, doing it step by step. Admittedly, that's kind of also been a bit of a, uh, a bit of an issue in that we've gotten to the point of where the poem is today. And I'm like, there's still more I would want to do with it. <laughs> But then you're like, so same problem, but within the confines of a week. But I think having a week with it, with it's made me more attached to it. And so I'm, I'm much more confident I'm going to do more stuff with it outside of Napo Rimo rather than with 
uh, you know, the day by day basis where I'll be like day three, I'll be like, oh, that's a great line. But after 27 more different things in a different <laughs> round, it's gone. Whereas with this one, it's, it's a bit less to hold on to. So it works for, for my busier brain. I oh oh no Ooh, I'm so, sorry so I was just, I I just, just wanted the finish. attention no like no you you're fine I was I was just going to finish up by sort of linking it back to the bit about concrete is I do have some concerns that I have done it it's it's more loose like the loose version of concrete one of the things uh, when I was doing this is I watched the concrete workshop by Katie Ailes and there was there was one oh. bit where so basically if the the poem kind of couldn't really be read without it being seen then it maybe wasn't quite as, as solid a link and so I, I definitely think my issue with this is I worked more on the poem than the visual art piece side of it I wouldn't worry dude you're not gonna <laughs> no one's gonna think that after they've seen my <laughs> Oh, okay, well, fair enough. <laughs> but I think actually this does bring up quite a, an interesting conversation that so we're in a very fortunate position here at I Am Loud to have Katie, well, you know, as crazy and wonderful as she is, is still technically a doctor in uh, spoken word poetry and poetry Allegedly. in general and all of these other fantastic things that we need, which leads me to often uh, pushing her limits in terms of what she knows by asking weird questions of what would constitute as concrete poetry. Um, so we did have a bit of a discussion this week. Uh, I know that everyone did really conceptual pieces, so I'm really excited to start demonstrating them. Uh, but one of the things that we discussed was a piece that I had written previously, which is called uh, Dairy for a New School Year. That's all, uh, it's a poem that's made entirely of misspelt words of, um, what's the official homonyms. title? Homonyms. Homonyms. Yeah. Uh, of homonyms and things like that. So when it is read aloud, the meaning is that is conveyed is still the correct of a letter with maybe a couple of you know typos in it but when you look at it it's a very different piece and we were trying to understand whether that constitutes as concrete poetry and where that line is drawn so i think kev nodding did you have any interesting envisionings yeah. with you doing your conceptual Genuinely, processing it's for concept it's poetry yeah it's interesting that you you mentioned that of like how um you know, is it this form or is it that form? Because mine, I was like, it is concrete, right? There is a, there is a, the shape of the piece on the page does, is impacted by like a, a like sort of, I guess, art visually artistic choice, right? But then I was like, it also kind of, you'll see when you, you hear mine or see it, it, it kind of leans into erasure, which is something I know the four of us have looked at before. Um, if you were looking at the Return to Form workshops in that playlist, there's two that are kind of like the pilot uh, stuff we did. And Katie also did a, a workshop for erasure. So if you want to know what I'm talking about, go check that out. But it's essentially like taking words away, which is kind of what I've done. Um, so like, I find that interesting of going, you know, where where is the line between concrete and then something else? Uh, if people are trying to get an impression of what you're talking about there, Bex, there is a very good ver version. One of my favorite uh, spoken word poets is a guy called Taylor Molly. Uh, he's he's from Rhode Island in the States. He's like a, a slam champ and stuff like that. Uh, he has a poem called The Impotence of Proofreading. Um, and it's <laughs> it's that. It's, you know, the kind of misspelling and stuff and all the humor is tied into the misunderstanding. But if you pay attention, you get exactly what he's trying to say. And there's an interesting piece of like, you know, does that make it concrete? No, but I imagine if you did it in the kind of like, you could do lots of annotations on the page and stuff mm -hmm. like that and make almost like a visual representation of a draft of a poem. And you're like, is mm -hmm. that a draft of a poem or is it a concrete poem that's been finished it would be an interesting uh, debate but then you know you get into definition debates and and where does that go I had an interesting chat with Kat Hepburn uh, the other day when we were recording the loudcast that'll be out you know weeks from now I don't know um, but we, we were chatting about about that kind of thing of like definitions when is it a monologue when is it a poem you know those kind of <laughs> things and I I have no I have no concrete answer hey -o. Uh, but no, I I, I I did not enjoy concrete poetry. Um, oh. I'm not a visual artist. It made me very stressed and sad. And then I thought I got something really good. Uh, but now I'm doubting it because I, I got a, a brief glimpse of some of the other PCs. I've not like read them, but I did, I did see, because obviously we have to put the podcast together. I did see a brief image of them and I'm, I'm upset. But I think it's really uh, interesting that you say that because everyone did do something very different. I know we've been talking about your piece, Kev. Did you want to did you want to share it and describe it to people since we're talking about it already? 
Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll describe it first because it, it's a fairly easy description because I am not a complex uh, visual artist. But basically, I was I watch a lot of YouTube sitting at my desk while I'm like editing or, or, or you know working on admin stuff. I kind of just watch random YouTube videos, and there's a channel that I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of. I think it's Kurzaga. I'll put a link obviously here uh, where, where you can find them, and it's just a really cool. Um, sort of YouTube channel that does good voiceover over a kind of nice animation and explores like a theoretical scientific concept or an economic concept or a piece of history or whatever. And they have a video on Lascaux Cave. And uh, Lascaux Cave is in France, Lascaux. Uh, and it is, <laughs> it was discovered basically- Mais oui. <laughs> yeah, During the Second World War, these three young French boys um, found this cave. And when they went into the cave, they found uh, a huge array of artwork. Um, so like animals uh, and things like that. And then deep in the cave, they found all these sort of negative images of hands. So basically the process is people would place their hand against the wall and through like a, a, a straw, they would blow red pigment and, and capture a negative image of their hand. And this is replicated across the world in cave art. Um, and you know, from from people that were never connected, and it really captured me that idea of like this intrinsic need, because obviously back in those days, you know, every minute was spent trying to survive, and so for people to take time out and figure out how to paint a bison on the ceiling of a cave when there was no way for them to reach it, they would have to have built and constructed means to get up there. It just speaks to like an innate human need to create stuff, but it also speaks to the gap, the things we don't know about them, the missing image, because we only get the negative of the hand. And I just, I, I found that fascinating. Personally, I found it really interesting as well because a lot of the hands are missing fingers um, because obviously the time frame and stuff. And I, I, I just thought it'd be very interesting, you know, seeing a hand that looks more like my hand. Uh, so I decided to write my concrete poem on that. And visually, so this is why I'm saying I've kind of maybe cheated and done an erasure poem. Because what I did was I just wrote a poem. I just wrote um, this poem about Lascaux Cave. And then I uh, cut out a handprint uh, in the middle of the poem. So there is a missing section. The fingers obscure certain points. You can still read a huge percentage of the poem. You could still glean what I'm talking about, but you'll never get the full picture because there's the negative image of a hand in the, in the center. So that is the um, kind of visual idea behind it. And now I will, I will read you the poem. <clears throat> Walk in the dark and it is only soil and stone. Call out and hear only your own echoing tone. This inhospitable hole is the furthest thing from a home. Musty air that swirls with ancient dust, tunnels strewn with bones. Breathe in the history. Cough and gasp, no familiar tastes in these particles of the past. This place is old. But so are we. And all we ever needed was the light to see. Flickering flame casts a glow that travels back. Back to the feed of the pack, the bite of the cold, the warmth of the gathering, the joy of a story told. Fire stretches its fingers, and black walls flood with colour. The collected effort of generations, an art installation 17,000 years in the making, a painstaking effort in a time so hard to survive. No reward in mind. Just a way to say we were alive. Or perhaps there was a purpose, a guide to the flora and fauna that could hurt us, lessons too painful to trust to words spoken. A hall of bulls might simply be a symbol of a single heart broken. Maybe they are a map a plan of attack, the animals easiest to track, time spent now but with full bellied interest later paid back. There is no way of knowing for sure, but these are not the images that act as Lascaux's lure. It is the hands. They are reaching, grasping, 
pulling directly from the past the red, pig red pigment blasted absence of a person's pressed palm upon the rock the thought that you can touch the stone face and place yourself in the exact space of someone so unrecognizable someone who died before history had begun but who felt compelled for some memory to be held long after they were gone how can that be anything but humbling how could you still your hands from trembling? Would your mind flash to finger painting? A nursery class of 20th century children placing handprints on paper, later to be displayed not on cave walls, but magnet held to family refrigerators. Would you still see unfathomable difference? Or would you see it's only an arm's reach? that's between us. Wow. Oh, so good. Oh, yeah. This is a very uh, traditional habit of Kev's to be, oh, mine's not going to be very right. good compared to anyone else's and then to read an excellent poem. Sorry, no, I, I appreciate that. I, thank you. But um, I'm sorry, <laughs> my, 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 my point was more that like, I struggle as a visual artist. So I, I feel that like the, because I basically, I, when you see Mark and Katie, you'll understand because mine <laughs> is just literally like a bit of cardboard with a printed out poem and then a big hand print card. <laughs> and so I'm like, but but I don't know. And I would make changes. I would I would make the um the font of the the words around the hand red because I think it would give more of the feel of of like the spray of the pigment, and I think that would maybe help it. Um, but but yeah, I have other ideas and stuff. But I'm not a visual artist, and I think it was. But I, I do think it really hammers home the thing of the poem, right? The theme of the poem, and that was what I went for. So <laughs> yeah, I think it was really great. Katie looks like she has some comments on it as well. Is no, it officially I'm... a concrete poet? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Yes. Um, yeah, because I, I, <laughs> I mean, because I am the arbiter of poetry definitions. Never forget this. No, I, I think what's really brilliant about this because Kevin and I were talking about it a little bit. Um, because he he kept asking me, he was like, "Is this concrete? Does this technically count?" And I'm very like, very insecure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think particularly, you know, when you're working with a new form and particularly one where um, the definition is so broad, you know, it's very easy with something like a Sestina, which we'll be looking at later this month to have a yes or no answer. Is this a Sestina? Well, do you use those six repeating words in the exact mathematical order? If yes, then yes. If no, then no. It's very easy to say yes or no because there are clear cut definitions and restrictions. Whereas with concrete poetry, it's way fuzzier, which for some people is welcome and for some people makes it that much harder. And I think for all of us, it made it that much harder <laughs> to have it be really open. But I think the the really brilliant thing about yours, Kev, is that um, the, the handprint isn't just ornamentation. It isn't just an additional, oh, this is pretty, but it adds to the meaning. Um, it is significant in the meaning of this handprint represents the absence, which you're getting at through the poem. It, it is an absence of um, color through the pigment, but it is also the representation of that person having been there and then having died. And then in that negative space, as you point out, you could, you know, someone today could put their hand in that space and sort of connect to the past. And um, the fact that without you reading that poem aloud, half of the poem is missing, that really significantly represents, to me at least, I interpret it as sort of a representation of that loss of history. You know, these people 17,000 years ago were quote unquote prehistoric, right? So what does that mean? What do we know about them apart from, you know, what archeologists tell us and, and this ancient art? So yeah, I, I think it's really conceptually interesting and and yeah. I really liked it. One of the things that, like, again, was in my brain for it, and like, I don't know where it's perfectly represented. You know, a poem changes from the initial idea to to the finished thing. But I kind of wanted to get across the idea. Like, I don't write for the page. I I, I write for <laughs> you know the stage, and so I think a lot about like how my poems would look written down and what they lose written down from the performance. And it was a very clear way to say like, if you hear me read that poem, you will get the whole poem. But if you only want to, you know, because like that it, it tied into the idea of like our oral histories and traditions are passed down, right? We, we, there's, there's no way to lose that other than if you stop telling the story. Whereas when you try and 
put something like i'm here look it just adds questions it just you don't know you don't see the full picture even though it's tangible in there you'd be better to look for the story and so i kind of want you to pair that into it as well but yeah yeah like it's yeah i don't know it's great mark would you also like to praise kev on his poem <laughs> I wouldn't like to, but I Oh, will. okay. Well, that's why we can move on. Um, uh, no, that's no, I, can't, I, can't, I can't help it. I'm glad he, he brought up that bit right at the end is the, um, the link that you're saying that, you know, that you don't, um, you know, really write for for page more for thing. And that's what I'm saying is, is within that, if you're reading it, I think the beauty of going, you, it'll gain something for you seeing the, on the page with the imprint of the hand. But then I also think you then, obviously you get the full picture, but you also get the, especially with that one, I always love, particularly on the vowel A, your assonance on a lot of your lines mm -hmm. and your like your beat that goes through it. So you're going like, while it doesn't, you don't gain the same thing from it being spoken. You you gain uh, you gain from it being spoken, but lose something. And then in the same vein, sort of vice versa. And I think that ties together really nicely into, especially with the background story of what it's about. I think it, it, it adds a connection that I don't know whether intended or not, but... I mean, that's kind of, no, you're bang on. I was trying to find that balance of like, you know, because that's kind of what I see concrete as, right? It's like, because a lot of poets talk about formatting on the page. And like, I know when I did my sort of self-published pamphlet early on and that, I had no idea how to lay out poems and Kate had to... <laughs> <laughs> CDs are still it, but... available. <laughs> Kate had to walk me through, you know, kind of how you do um, typeset and stuff. And like, I think concrete is the most extreme version of that, where you go, no, 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 it's not even about typesetting. It's about reinforcing the theme, not not about the beat of your language. Don't don't teach them how to read it. Make make the, it easier to understand in the reading, right? And so I, I quite I quite like concrete poetry, even though it's a, a form that frightens me and because I'm not a visual artist but but the idea of being able to reinforce your poems in a very literal way on the page does bring that and so it was yeah it was trying to find that balance which is cool I, I do want to just as well reiterate Mark your point that you made at the start which was having the week did make it a totally different mindset because like I I, I had that last school thing in my mind and had we been doing it in a day, I would not have wanted to write about it because I've been thinking about it. And I was like, there's there's something in there. It really captured me. And I don't get that a lot where I go see something, go, oh my God, I want to write a poem about that. Right? It doesn't happen a mm -hmm. huge amount. But I, I did with this and I wouldn't have wanted to not waste it, but but you know, I, I wouldn't want it to put something out there early that was was unfinished and kind of not whole. So actually having this to to pare down and, and focus in on was was great because it let me have kind of a couple of days to research both concrete poetry and lasco and do a lot of reading and and like the references to specific animals is accurate and like the time frame is accurate and like yeah I, I, underpinning those little bits of, of detail while not you know don't learn about lasco from that poem but but you know you are going to get a, at least realistically kind of more fleshed out idea than if i'd tried to barter through it in a day so yeah really really good fun no, that's great. I think it's really good to have that extra length of time to obviously develop ideas, but also to allow you to do the research that you want, Helen of Troy, uh, into anything that you are particularly looking to write about. Um, I, I don't know much about your uh, concrete poem, Mark. I've only kind of seen briefly, but uh, from what I did see, it does look very you. Uh, do you want to do you want to tell us about it? Introduce us to your poem. Read your poem. Any of those things? Yeah, all of those yeah, things, actually. yeah. I'll, uh, actually, all of those. All, all of those. You would like all the? Okay. I would like all uh, of them. Please. Thank all you. of those yeah. things. Okay. Um, so this is so this is where I I, I get confused by. Uh, I assume Kev can't be talking about mine because my concrete poem for those that are just listening, it just looks like a stick man made out of the words of a poem. In in, in my in my opinion, um, I sort of decided with this very early on, I wasn't going to try and reinvent the wheel. I was already quite nervous about concrete, and so I went right. What's sort of the a more or maybe not a more basic, but one that I'm more familiar with, which is that like having the image and putting words to fit the image. And I was like, okay. But then the question then becomes of what image do you use? You know, do you do the poem for it? Do you do it? It brings its own problem. So I was thinking about what image to, um, to use. And I wanted it to be, even though I was kind of going there, right, I want to do image and text. I still wanted the image to inform the poem a bit. And if I could, you know, a bit vice versa. And eventually for the sake of time, I settled on 
so for any that are fans of Avatar, like The Last Airbender and that kind of like animated series, I uh, am a big fan of it. Like a lot of people, uh, for me, I have a, a special love from my personal martial arts background. Um, and so I really like this idea of that, the four elements and that sort of spiritual side, all of these things within one person, that concept of, of spirit and balance and uh, a lot of these things. So I have um, a, a picture of a character uh, from there, Avatar 1, for those that watch. For people that don't watch, essentially envision a almost like typical, I suppose it would be an American looking martial arts character. They're in an orange uh, martial arts uniform. They have uh, big brown hair. And on the image proper, they are swirling themselves in rocks and in earth and in water. Um, I do have plans to do stuff with them, but for again, for the time I had, and I do want to do more with this, my words basically just outline the shape of, of the individual. But I think I've done something, I, I've tried to be quite clever with it in that each different part of the body is written with a different one of the four elements in mind. And then with another bit being, that last bit being the spiritual mm. bit. Um, so there's a couple of different ways you could read it from looking at it as a concrete poem. I think most people would read it the way, either not the uh, the way that I initially wrote it or would read it. But uh, what I also did quite nice about this is this poem, if you read it like forward to back and you can read it back to forward and it still makes sense. But uh, when you cool. go back, that incorporates it is multiple forms. slightly more sinister. So oh. that... Um, so I'll read it the 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 the, the way I wrote it. Is and the it way a concrete I sort of palindrome poem, or is what's it called? I don't. I don't yeah. know. It was kind of yeah. the, well. The initial thing of it going back to four was only supposed to be under the idea of water. I wanted to do that incorporation of water within itself. That is this sort of stream thing. Um, but I'll read sort of the whole poem. And against for if you can see the image or you're looking at the image. Uh, obviously, most of the time we read from the top down. This one, the way I wrote it, begins right at the bottom. Um, so, uh, and I will just move this over here so I can look at this. Okay. So I'm not just staring over here. It begins with the stance. Make it strong. Make it deep. Be patient. This is your ground. Find the balance. Feel the dirt between your toes. Let it hold you. Stretch your fingers. Close your fist, feel the blood rush, feel the flow like water, formless, shapeless, the push and the pull. Summoned from the center, the source of energy, passion, the drive to dream, a dangerous thing, control it, feed it, let it burn bright, let it rage. Take a breath. Relinquish the thought, let loose the tether, detach. Be empty, be here, now. Find peace in freedom. We can help you. We didn't go anywhere. We have always been here. We understand. We have listened. We have learned. We can teach you we can make you whole. And so that's all the words in an order. Uh, and in the order, I think, makes the most sort of flowy, lyrically kind of sense to it. Uh, but for uh, being able to see the image or for thingy, the sort of uh, the stanzas about earth are in the legs, water, the arms up to the shoulders, fire is in the belly, uh, air then in the chest and then the sort of more spiritual side comprises uh, the head and the hair because thankfully this guy's got a lot of hair so I could fit more words there um, <laughs> yeah that's that a top so tip from cool. Mark if you're going to draw uh, if you're going to go with a, an image make sure it's a person with a lot of hair yeah so it gives you some more space. more space yeah so, you know, I think that is so cool what a tiny... great piece oh, thank awesome. you so there's there's lots more I would like to do with it um, and so it's one of these ones where I'm like more proud of the poem this is where i was worried about not really meeting the criteria because i put a lot of time like i put quite a lot into the poem and then it was like it informs like a bit and you couldn't really read that properly looking at it um 
uh, but like things uh, like part of the thing in the workshops when she was Kate was talking about logs, writing things along it for the the bigger, grosser image. Uh, the expanded idea I would want to have is almost like either descriptive words or extra stuff, but in the actual elements that are surrounding the picture, things more directly and more, I suppose, more bluntly tied to those elements rather than the more martial artsy, spiritual, flowery, poemy thing that I have done there. But yeah, as a concrete poem, it's a stick man, and I I managed to color code it to but look it's like so the image. So much more complicated uh, than that. Like, this is so... okay. We, I mean, we are all horrendous underseller's here, other than me, because yeah. I know how fabulous no. I am. But uh, everyone <laughs> else is a horrendous underseller here, Mark. That was absolutely incredible, and the fact that that can be read even with a vague meaning that could, uh, you know, a, a vague conveyed meaning backwards at all uh, is a very impressive thing. And also, if people don't know how to read your poem, that's not your fault. No, uh, yeah, it's on the They picture. should try harder. Well, weirdly, I was looking at it, and I'm. <laughs> it, it's a bit clunkier in places, which is why if I was going to do this, I would do things. But I, I think you can put pretty much any of the stanzas, barring the sort of spiritual one that would probably need to go at the start and the end. And obviously, the Earth one has the it begins, so some are clunkier. But you could, in theory, kind of put them in any sort of order, and they sort of at least work-ish. Um, mm. So I'd say not finished. Mm. So there's more I would definitely do, but... That was kind of the image yeah. informing more the meaning of the image than the actual image. Sorry, Kay. No, no, I was just going to jump off of that and say it's one of the brilliant things about concrete poetry is that many of them are open. They're ambiguous as to the order in which they can be read, depending on how they're visually arranged on the page. You know, you see a lot of artists sort of playing around with that. Um, in the workshops, I, I shared Edwin Morgan's Chaffinch map of Scotland, um, and I, I shared it again on Twitter the other day um, for those of you who follow us there for, for tips, which I would encourage you to do. But that's another one where you can sort of read it in any order. And um, and there are many other pieces where, where sort of the meaning changes depending on where you begin. And so that's one of the really brilliant things I think about concrete poetry is that it can, um, twist or resist our tendency to read poems in a left to right top to bottom order if we're if we're reading in english right um which is great you know i just i, I <laughs> it's so annoying <laughs> like it's because it, i saw the image and i was like that's really good because like i, I know marcin is a, a stick figure and stuff but it's 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 a very clear image of the person that is, you know, when you put them side by side, it's like, or even without it, you would go, that's a person in words. But it's like, because it's, I, I again, maybe because I'm old, but I think about like, when, when I think about visual art, right? Or when you said stick man, I literally pictured like you had drawn a stick man on a page and like written words, which in my head looked terrible, but it's a really nice, it's being able to use, I look at like, I'm trying to make a point. I look at like concrete now and think how much more you can do in a world where we have like computer literacy and like a lot of people have the ability to do graphical elements. And like, Mark, I know you've been putting a lot of effort into learning how to do after effects and like more photoshoppy stuff and graphical elements i know bex you've been working on that as well and like we're not you know because it kind of came out during the week we're not focusing on it so much but your concrete poem uh, that people can go and check out on the youtube page go and go and see it is amazing and it has that kind of like you know graphical element to it with words coming in and stuff and you go guys like edwin morgan and stuff imagine what he would have done if he was yeah. you know had the access to those things and was more literate with them at the time you go it's it really blows my mind i, I see something like that and go what a great way to do it it's so clear there's no confusion you can see all the words you can read it multiple ways it ties into something else it's thematically accurate it's like in itself an interesting piece of fan art like you should post that on you know some um avatar page and stuff because that's like really a, a, such a cool way to do fan art i would love to see a series from you of like animated characters you know that you really enjoy that and like explore that character in the form of these you know kind of concrete pieces because that's so cool what what cool poster to have of you know what i mean like a bunch of naruto characters each made up of their own little descriptive um you know poem that'd be amazing sorry i don't Coming know if that's just me keep your eyes out on our twitter guys we'll be on that <laughs> 
if you would like to see an entire amount of anime characters reduced to, well, not reduced, but comprised of concrete poetry, let us know in the comments below. It's, and it's I'm like going to do it anyway. It's like a poetic version of those, like, oh, your, your social media word usage bubbles, right? That's supposed to represent mm -hmm. you. But don't just do random words you tend to use. I'm yeah. not represented by the word, you know, come and see, but that's what I write all the time. <laughs> Or check this out, but like, yeah. but, but doing Subscribe. a more version where those words, because that's what it feels like, right? It feels like you know the sort of different sized words and the placement, like doing that where they actually reflect something about the the character you're representing visually. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, you did great, Mark. Thanks. So thank much you. love this morning. I'm going to just hide behind my microphone for Welcome a bit. to the No Podcast, where four friends compliment each other for an hour. <laughs> Speaking of which, Katie, you look dazzling. Would you like to share a poem <laughs> with us? <laughs> I would, in fact. Great. Um, yeah, I, this is great because, again, everyone has taken a totally different approach um, and mine's going to seem very different after these, which I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but, you Always know, a good thing. I'm not be self-deprecating and instead go art, experimentation. Um, no one created anything without innovation, Katie. Got to do something new. I, I, know, I don't know who said that, but if it, I coined that, I want it on a mug. Anyway, continue, Katie, with I'm your lovely it. poem. Uh, yeah, so I, I was thinking a lot, um, as I said last week in the podcast, this is the form that scares me the most because it is the most open to interpretation and because um, I, I, yeah, have a lot of training in, in poetry, but my interest lies in sort of storytelling and wordplay and um, performance and all of these things. And so with Concrete, I really wanted to challenge myself to do something completely different and something very much unlike the kind of poetry that I write. Um, and so I did a lot of digging into different styles of concrete poetry and I really attached onto Edwin Morgan's work. Um, and so obviously I've mentioned him before, but just a bit of context, um, major Scottish poet, um, began writing sort of in the in the 60s and 70s um passed away in 2010 yeah brilliant Becky brilliant Lipton writer have done a great collection for him yes way. just a plug um, in the thing and and brilliant writer um a uh, queer writer um uh who came out sort of later in life um and also someone who really experimented quite a lot with uh form and with genre. And so he was one of the pioneers of concrete poetry in Scotland, alongside Ian Hamilton Finlay, who um, we mentioned last week, who did a lot of literal concrete poetry <laughs> through um, stone sculptures. Um, so yeah, so in any case, I, I took a lot of inspiration from their work, um, Morgan's in particular, and specifically their work, which sort of is more abstract and conceptual and almost sort of mathematical in how it approaches things. Um, so I guess the best way of doing this, I will read the poem first, which won't take me very long. And then I will uh, describe it to, to people who aren't uh, watching um, to, to our podcast listeners and, and try to get across the concept. Um, so the, yeah, the poem reads, <clears throat> go go to her, get her, tether to her, or regret her. So that's, that's the poem. Um, and to describe the visuals of the poem. So basically, um, yeah, as I said, I was, I was thinking a lot about how to do something a little bit more conceptual with this. And I thought about, um, I was particularly inspired by Edwin Morgan's poem, Archives, um, where he basically repeats the phrase generation upon generation upon generation, and then it just breaks down. Um, we also shared that on our Twitter and you can Google it if you're interested. So I was inspired by that and I started thinking about, okay, how can I play with words and how can I sort of break down words to, to get different meanings out of it? And um, I started thinking about the word together and the many meanings of the word together, but also how if you break down the word together, there are so many words inside of it. And so what I did, for those of you who can't see, I pasted the word, I copied and pasted the word together probably about 200 times in a block of text. It just repeats together, 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 together. And it's all in sort of a light gray color in regular font 
and then I made certain letters uh, red and bold within that. And those letters spell out the text of the poem. And what I was trying to do conceptually, um, the word together never actually appears in the poem, but it is the backdrop of the poem. Um, and obviously there are various interpretations that you could get out of this, but the interpretation that I was trying to do is around the pressure to be in a relationship, the pressure to be with people, to find someone to be together with others, which I think particularly right now, obviously a lot of people are feeling and coming out of lockdown, I think will be a weird pressure, especially if you've been single. Okay, now go get someone, go tether to someone, right? Um, so the backdrop of togetherness and and this sort of message of, okay, go go find someone. And if you don't find someone, you'll, you'll regret it. Um, without any sort of clear political point or, or personal point. But, <laughs> but I think one of the, one of the main um, interesting things, as I was saying earlier about concrete poetry is sort of the, the ambiguity of meaning and, and the extent to which you could arguably read this in a number of different ways. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to do. Oh, okay. I, it was really great when, when I saw an image of it, it's so vastly different from anything that I kind of expected. I don't know what I expected you to do, but it is so different from what I was sort of envisioning that you would create mm. that it's, it's a really impressive uh, construction. Like it really kind of is and like the whole visual element of it. Um, go definitely go to our Instagram guys. We'll have these posted up. You can go and check them all out and tell us which one you like best or tell them you like us, like us all equally, which is also great. Um, but yeah, I just, I just really, really loved yours, Katie. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> I just, because on that, Bex, like you're bang on. I think it's interesting. I need to keep saying, I think everything's interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, to me, it really stood out that um, Mark and I, as much as I think Mark's is visually like really interesting and, and really adds, I, I think we have both, it's a hole in a pool. Right, um, yeah, but yeah, I think, I, but it's it's interesting that it's like it's interesting uh, that it, that Katie has really swung into the literary aspect of concrete poetry. Right, me and Mark both made stuff that still at the root. I think what we try and write for is always spoken word. You know mm. what I mean? Even when me and Mark play with literary forms, we we do always kind of root it in. Ah, but it's worthwhile if I can read it on a stage at the end, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what we we do. Whereas Kate, obviously, your background is more literary, and Bex, I know you, uh, you're someone I guess people would con consider <laughs> way more performance. But recently, you know, in your writings, you have leaned much more, especially through cows and stuff. I think you've been opened up to form, and I can see the appeal for it to you. Um, and it's interesting because that's so much more like Edward Morgan, Edwin Morgan, than stuff. You know, the the that that concrete level me and mark will read ours as a piece whereas yours doesn't get that same pop you're never going to add that into your set because no, the poem not itself all. is so abstract and 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 kind of out there but it, it shows why edwin morgan resonates with so many people mm. because you know we we often talk about what is the point of poetry and stuff and you go well it's to lay out a personal story and make it personal but allow it to be laid upon the reader's story or the listener's story. And there's something about your concrete poem where having that word together, 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 never said, and then the spacing, you do read it, you know, because it's not just picking the random letters. You've not just went, oh, no, 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 no. The spacing between go, go to her. And so, it's, you know, it, it, it does reinforce the reading, which is a fascinating thing to be able to do within those those limitations. I think it's it's probably the, the purest literary one that we've had this week out of out of us. And it's, it's I would, it encourages me to play with that kind of more specifically wordy concrete form, you know, rather than Ian Finlay or, or a kind of, you know, what we've done more conceptual, like to go for that Edwin Morgan thing. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, could you like to compliment? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh no, no. I was, I was just gonna say that with that for, talk about the the literary thing because like, I mean this in an entirely positive way. When I first heard it, the first thing I did was just start analyzing it, which I don't, you know, you don't necessarily do with spoken word. But mm. it's like you were saying at the end with no political, with no particular agenda. But I immediately I'm going well. Yeah, the word together is not there, and the option is like tether or regret. But you know, it's true togetherness is never present. Is that like I'm immediately going? Did she mean any of this, or were the curtains just blue? But you know, like <laughs> straight away, run you start thinking about deeper meaning, and so yeah, and I was completely different to what I thought 
well, I'm getting constantly blown away by what I thought concrete could be. I didn't think it could be a bridge in a park. <laughs> here, we, here we go. And um, yeah, I was just like the, it's a, a very, very powerful literary piece. And I always like that sit like so much with a very short piece. You know? mm. yeah. I, yeah, it, it was interesting actually, because when I, I posted that Edwin Morgan poem archives up on my Twitter to, to say, you know, I'm taking inspiration from this. And like, I mean, I'm not saying it went viral or anything, but like a ton of people liked it and shared it. And a bunch of people were like, this is one of my favorite poems ever. And you go, it's two words that are just repeated many times and then it erodes at the bottom. And I think it's, it's like what Kev was saying earlier, you know, there's something about poetry where in doing something very distilled and specific, you can create a universal experience in which people can attach to in different ways. You know, um, you could read my poem in very, very different ways. And again, you know, that's the joy of poetry. It doesn't matter what I intended writing it. You know, I could have been thinking about the film King Kong and, you know, it doesn't matter. Right. It matters <laughs> go, go, what go. it would go, fit. It would fit. Her, oh right? my God. <laughs> Regret. <laughs> oh. I should clarify that I wasn't, but oh, now wow. I am. Not up to um, you anymore. <laughs> anyone writing my you know biography in a hundred years please note this poem was inspired by the film king kong um <laughs> but yeah no i i think um yeah again it's that joy of, of multiple interpretations and there's sort of this interesting effect where like the shorter the poem is and the more condensed it is the more open it is to interpretation um which is sort of brilliant so yeah it was fun to play around with that because again this is not something i've ever done before so um yeah. i don't know if i'll do it again but maybe i will well, you all, all of you did great. You look wonderful. Your poems were fabulous. And we have uh, completed construction on Concrete Week. We're ready to move forwards. And uh, we're still doing construction, though, because we're going to the Golden Shovel. Yeah! Um, Katie will be hosting next week. So, Katie, do you want to give us a bit of an understanding about what a Golden Shovel is? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. You have another um, hat specifically for that? Um, by next week, I will. <laughs> uh, yeah, golden shovels. Oh, I am so excited for next week. Um, they are great because they're a relatively recent form of poetry. So to give sort of a, a condensed description, um, and again, for more, please watch my workshop on the forum. It gives uh, examples and more about the history and all of that. But essentially... Um, in 2010, Terence Hayes, who's an absolutely tremendous US-based poet, um, wrote a poem uh, called uh, The Golden Shovel. And basically what he did is he took Gwendolyn Brooks's iconic poem, We Real Cool, uh, Seven Players at the Golden Shovel. Uh, so he took that poem and he used the words of the poem in their proper order as the line ending words for a new poem. Um, and it's sort of easier to visualize that. So again, go check out um, my workshop or the return to form poems that we commissioned um, in that form by Rachel Amy and Tawana Sithole to sort of see more clearly what I mean there. Um, but basically when he wrote this poem in 2010, people just fell in love with it and said, oh my gosh, this is a new form, right? Um, I don't know that Terence Hayes ever intended to create a new form in this way, but it really took off. Um, and initially, and, and sort of, it's strange to use the word traditionally here, but traditionally, golden shovels are uh, based in Gwendolyn Brooks poems, but people have started using other forms of poems for them. Um, you can use a poem by any writer that you'd like. You can, I mean, if you want, you could even use, you know, song lyrics or something like that, a different piece of text. Um, and they're fascinating because they you can engage with the source poem in any way that you want. So it can be, Terence Hayes's poem is sort of a, a tribute to Gwendolyn Brooks's original poem. It's an expansion upon it. It's an updating of it. Um, you can do it as sort of a rebuttal of the original poem, as a conversation with it, as any sort of engagement with it. So um, yeah, they're fascinating poetic uh the golden shovel is a fascinating poetic form um lots of directions to go with it and i'm really excited for this week i think we're gonna have a lot of fun yeah i'm really excited as well um i have actually written a golden shovel before which i will be sharing with you guys very shortly uh, to to end off the podcast uh, but i just want to ask very quickly boys are you scared katie's very excited are you you scared of the golden shovel 
Nope. Already picked my poem. Already got my end words Ooh. written. Ooh. Kev, are you scared? Now you're feeling annoyed because you're the least prepared. <laughs> no, what my issue is. <laughs> <laughs> Are we gonna right, time for this segment? Yes, if you do, could you explain it to me so I can fix it? <laughs> no, no. The, the The issue for me is I uh, I'm like a I'm that dude. I'm the the epitome of the dude who cannot pick the thing on Netflix because I want to watch the perfect thing. Like I, I you know, I mean, I want to watch the thing that fits perfectly for that time. And I have been thinking <laughs> for weeks <laughs> about. <laughs> what I would use as the base for my golden shovel and I am no closer to thinking it out. So kind of I'm really chilled about the form because I've not really considered that bit yet. Um, <laughs> you know what Kev, we'll, I have, we'll see. I have three words for you uh, and they are Helen and of and Troy. <laughs> So uh, yeah. don't overthink it, <laughs> for my sake, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, though. I, I'm excited for Golden Shovel, actually, because I think it's one that's more in my vein of, like, you know, use those specific words, put them where they need to be, figure out, yeah, yeah. it'll be good, so I'm going to be fine. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into to my Golden Shovel, uh, mm. and then we will wrap up and whatever. Uh, my, my source material for my Golden Shovel is actually a poem by Kevin MacLean. Um, as a little bit of context to this, there is a yes. poem that we collectively all use. Uh, it's become oh, a bit of a on. meme, right? Uh, that's become a bit of a meme, yes. and it's it's Kev's poem. I want no. Can I? Okay, and I and I've not do it, done it to take the piss. I actually genuinely really love this poem. It's just become a bit of the. It's the poem we all know and we all mic check with. Pretty much all of us know all the words to this poem. It's a really lovely um. It's a really lovely piece by Kev, and we did some footage to our friend's amazing wedding, and you can check that out on our YouTube as well. Um, but I, what I wanted to do with uh, this was back in January. Uh, I started working on this when the original Golden Shovel workshop came out. And I, what I wanted to do is take the message where it's this really nice love poem about, you know, the future and together and whatever, and kind of twist it to make it about heartbreak. Um, so I this is my version of, shovel. yeah, so this is my version of I Want, inspired by Kevin McLean, and it is called I Am Afraid. I am afraid. My want and need to be content has led me away for years. I climbed mountains and held back hurricanes from overhead so I didn't blow away. I remember the news of you, that storm I did not foresee that day you opened your heart to me, a book, and ripped out your pages to make space for our upcoming chapters, and I am afraid I've been written into a story without you. Lonely, wandering can heal the soul. I have walked for years but find my feet back standing here, trapped between everything and everything on different sides when it all faded away. And after, they said I'd be healed by time. Weird girl, traumatized. Could not cry on the outside, so I forged battle plans between double geography and science to allow time to break down. Using hurt to heal, it only makes me fall faster, crashing down into the deep valleys of the world, not quite the canyons we dreamed we'd visit together. I am afraid. I want things to go back to the way they were before, to be with you, but fate is a twisted friend. Fate, the gnawing, growling beast that walked right in, grabbed you, then coasted away. They told me to think of the good times, but our great American dream was cut short. The plans we made, nothing more than false promises. So tell me, can time heal wounds from swords not yet swung? You are gone now. You built a future for us and we're gone before we can even begin. And now all I have left are the chapters about you that you can't be in. Our sun will rise in the West. And when that day occurs, our separation will be at an end. But until then, I am afraid I need to love again. To put your book down, to start writing elsewhere. But I remember our love. I remember the song we danced to. I remember the night we first kissed, the night you said you loved me. And this is all, and if this is all God's plan, some awful test, then I am sorry to have failed you. I am not the author you deserve, a sick joke that we've been divided by more than nations. And I have trembled through every shaking step, nothing but the will of wanting to build my own story. A journey without destination, free walking, no railroads, open maps without rules, without anyone, without you, for I know now there cannot be an us. I am afraid, but I don't want to be. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Wow. So there is an example of a golden shovel for 
all it's much of better you. than the poem it's based <laughs> on. It's very different. Oh, uh, I, I, I feel like I've traumatized everyone. It's no longer this fun, joyful uh, experience. So we will leave the podcast there for you all to lick your wounds oh. and heal emotionally. Oh. Please do join us. <laughs> I just love dropping this bombshell and then leaving all of my friends. Um, join us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Please send your poems to us. If you send it, if you've done a concrete poem, we would love to see it. If you write a golden shovel, please send it in. If you're writing Napo Rimo and not using our prompts, you can also send your stuff. We would love to see it. We'll share it with everyone. It'll be a great old time. We'll have a fabulous time. Uh, please remember to subscribe, follow, share, review if your podcast platform allows that uh you know all of the other stuff that you're meant to do that everyone tells you to do you know what it is i'm not gonna bore you with the details uh, follow us on patreon where we do more stuff as well uh, we also if you want to see more podcasty goodness kev hosts loudcast we've just launched season two we spoke with imogen sterling she said some amazing poems that you should definitely check out uh, i'm gonna look at kev very quickly to see if i've done all the plugs that we need to do Everyone say goodbye. See you next week. (laughs) Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.